by saying I am an abolitionist, uh, both because slavery is very much alive today, and I think it's important to, to voice that, uh, but also because I approached um, this work from a radical perspective. Um, you know, we don't have to accept the systems and institutions that are given to us and try to reform them and actually create something new um, if we use our sociological imagination to, to create a better world uh, rather than trying to work within the structures that we're given. So um, I titled this All Roads Lead to Inequality because I'm trying to converge a lot of different issues uh, that the common thread behind them is inequality. How immigration leads to human trafficking and um, mass detention and mass incarceration. All of these have the same common um, causes and drivers behind it. So what you see on, in this photograph is actually from uh, an artist friend of mine, Phil Collins. Uh, he is part of a New Sanctuary Coalition, is an activist organization that supports sanctuary in New York State. And uh, there's a campaign called MoMA Divest. So it's the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, one of the lead board members is an investor in uh, private prisons. And uh, the private prisons are the ones that build immigration detention centers. It's the same companies. So um, Phil Collins, who's, who's an artist, had an exhibition there. He decided to pull out of MoMA in support of prison abolition and to not support detention centers. Uh, so this is uh, a demonstration from it. It's a from Art Forum article on October 30th. And I just want to read to you part of the Divest statement. It says, MoMA board member and BlackRock CEO, BlackRock uh, sells arms and things like that. So Larry Fink is the second largest shareholder of prison companies. GEO Group and Core Civic, with over $2 billion in contracts with Immigration and Customs Enforcement, which is ICE. These companies have been responsible for 70% of all immigration detention, including children and families, jails at the border, as well as the interior. So MoMA's own pension fund, Fidelity, is also one of the largest owners of these pri private prison companies. So that's how all these, these issues are coming together. Um, so, Um, and just as an aside, I wanted to highlight that this is powerful because I, I think this is what true allyship looks like. Um, he, uh, Phil and I, we had a conversation just a couple of days ago, which is when I picked up this, the picture, and he said it's not enough for me to sign this petition, I have to actually act and pull my heart out. And I think when, when we think about how to be allies to uh, undocumented people, to people who are being persecuted, you have to think of, am I profiting in some way? And what's the most responsible, what's the most accountability I can actually take and do that? So um, this is the only image that I actually found, um, just from Al Jazeera, that actually takes into account the multiple forms of modern-day slavery. Um, often when people say modern-day slavery, they're talking exclusively about human trafficking. Uh, but there, which includes sex trafficking, labor trafficking, and sex labor trafficking, which is the combination. But punitive incarceration in the United States is also a form of modern day slavery. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery except as punishment for a crime. Um, so if you're convicted of a crime, you are sent to prison in the United States. Uh, and that is meant to be an extension of slavery. Um, migrant detention is also a form of modern day slavery, and I'm going to talk more about that in this, in this talk, uh, but it operates very much the same way as the punitive incarceration system works in the United States, except you haven't been convicted of a crime. Um, and I add remission because it's just this sort of thing that's floating out there by itself. It's meant to not be part of any larger structure, but it is people who have lost their freedom and, and uh, you know, they haven't been charged with the crime, there is no end date, and it's, it's meant to sort of work outside the law. Um, so the UN definition is slavery is the status or condition of a person over whom any or all powers attaching to the right of ownership are exercised. 
That's the UN Slavery Convention of 1926. And I'll say that the definition of modern day slavery is not something that's agreed upon. Um, so sort of what constitutes ownership? If forced labor is necessary for, for it to be slavery, what constitutes forced labor? So these, the definitions are a little contentious, but um, I think the, the broad condition of ownership um, is, is what has, what these categories all have in common. And so that's 48, 45.8 million people in the world um, are currently living under modern day slavery. Um, and uh, it says 167 countries. I, it, there isn't really, if you look at all different forms, there really isn't a country in the world that doesn't have some form of modern day slavery happening in one way or another. So um, I'm not going to go into all of the forms in depth, but I do want to focus on um, how they're related to poverty and drives immigration, human trafficking, and the combined issue of migrants being trafficked um, together. So the only, please don't read this, and this is for me to actually <laughs> how long and convoluted the human trafficking definition is, uh, but I just want to clear up. Um, I know people have different uh, understandings of what trafficking is, uh, but movement actually isn't necessary to be trafficked. Um, it is, the key parts of it is um, the recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring, or receipt of persons by means of threat, use of force, or other form of coercion. Um, and consent of a victim is irrelevant when that person's a child. So the key is not movement, the key is coercion, um, not consent. So if, and there are different levels of, of coercion, but if coercion is present, then consent is not there. So both they can't coexist. So there are a lot of folks who will say, you know, oh, we're gonna help you get into this country without papers. You consent to that, but you didn't consent to uh, being forced to work in a massage parlor where you're not getting paid because you're you're doing this work in order to pay off the person who got you the papers and you have to perform sexual acts and as part of your job. So just because you consented to the first part doesn't uh, make it not trafficking. Um, and so that's that's kind of how human trafficking operates in such a broad level because there is usually some type of consent involved uh, that makes the victim feel that they are complicit and um, guilty of a crime and often criminalized. Um, so, talking about the scope of the problem. So, um, this is just on human trafficking. There are 40 uh, plus million people currently enslaved. It is a $150 billion industry, and to quantify, like to get a picture of what that is, that is the profits of Starbucks, Nike, Facebook, and Disney. That's how large the human trafficking industry is today. 71% um, are women and girls. Um, one in every four victims is a child. So this is the scope of the problem that's happening, and it is happening um, in every country in the world, and it's going up. The problem is getting bigger, not smaller. And the drivers of that are largely the inequality that drives immigration, um, that drives people to want to move, to want to leave, um, and the national xenophobic policies that make it harder to move legally and get papers. Those are major contributors to why human trafficking is on the rise. Um, so, ooh, let's see here. I'm going to skip that. So, to make it more explicit, these are the top five factors for human trafficking. And recent migration and relocation is the first one. Um, it's above substance abuse, runaway, homeless youth, mental health concerns, involvement in the child welfare system. But recent migration is the key risk factor. Um, and then methods of coercion that we talk about, isolation um, includes confinement, um, emotional abuse, economic abuse, threats of any kind, physical abuse, all of these things work together to keep someone in uh, a state of modern day slavery. Um, so it's not simple to, you know, you think 
obviously this is illegal, just get out. And it's actually very difficult to get out of a trafficking situation once you become a victim. Um, and just to, this is for Southeast Asia, these statistics, but it actually is a, it represents a global scale. Um, this was just a really in-depth study that I, that I really, I liked. Um, so the facilitating determinants, poverty is number one, it actually is above gender, which surprised me <coughs> from doing this work for a long time. Poverty is number one, gender, age means children, the younger you are, and migration. These are the most facilitating factors. Um, and the social determinants, poverty is number one, um, again, and then migration is number seven. So these issues of poverty, immigration, trafficking, they all go together. Um, so even though it's very clear that they go together, um, US policy acts like they don't. So um, people are going to move regardless. <laughs> We're not going to be able to stop people from moving based on just like cracking down on laws and being really hard on immigration because it's part of, of your identity, how you express yourself, how you actually have to enjoy the right to self-determination. You have to be allowed to move. So the global rise of xenophobia and nationalist trends have made movement go up but also be criminalized more. So um, this Just Security article came out called Human Trafficking's Vicious Link to Anti-Immigration Action. So, Mike Pompeo, um, he had this trafficking report that says um, they're going to hold countries accountable for ending this practice, not our country, but other countries, uh, unfolded in the shadows of an entirely contradictory administration policy of zero tolerance on immigration. So, because human trafficking is a complex problem that subsists on and is perpetuated by cultures and policies of xenophobia and discrimination, like Trump's anti-immigration agenda, it's irreconcilable to say that you're actually going to do something about human trafficking and have a zero tolerance policy on immigration. And traffickers use this to their advantage mm -hmm. um, in order to avoid detention, which they know is waiting for them to come to the United States. Traffickers are providing a, a way out. You can avoid immigration. I can get you across the border. You won't have to go to detention. You can stay in the United States. And this is making trafficking actually more attractive, like a better, a better system. Um, but immigration and detention centers run very much like jails. Um, and there, this is actually a picture of an immigration center. If this is a detention center, not a jail. And I, I teach in prisons, and um, there were a couple photos where I've seen of detention centers that actually look like the inside of Rikers, uh, which is a huge jail in New York. It's, it's horrible. It's, it's got to be the worst place I've ever taught. Um, and this is what immigration center, detention centers look like. Um, so there are nearly 200 federal detention centers across the country. And this is for people suspected of violating U.S. immigration laws, where they wait for court hearings to find out if they're going to stay in the United States or be deported. Um, but while they're waiting, they participate in what's called a voluntary work program. And this is where they cook, clean, do laundry, they maintain the facilities. Um, and for their labor, detainees are supposed to be paid at least $1 per day which is just under 13 cents per hour um, for up to an eight-hour work day. So this is a problem for many reasons. Uh, it violates state minimum wage laws, but it also violates the 13th Amendment, which is already problematic, right? The 13th Amendment already allows slavery to continue if you're convicted of a crime, but involuntary servitude is being mandated for people who haven't been convicted of a crime. So it's actually going one step further than something that's already a bad deal. Um, and the other major complication is that these companies that run ICE detention centers are supposed to be bringing, uh, building up the economy of the towns that they are being built in. So, um, 
let's say, the, um, the prison industrial complex was actually meant to bail out a lot of failing rural cities, of rural towns, right? So the factories close, people lose their jobs, and a jail or a prison pops up, and that's the main economy. So it was set up so that in order to solve the problem <coughs> of poverty among white people, you're going to warehouse mostly black and brown people to boost the economy. And that is what detention centers have started taking place. So even though some jails and prisons are shutting down, they're actually being converted into detention centers. So it's the same structure, it's operated by the same private companies, and now instead of warehousing black Americans mostly, they're warehousing like Guatemalan asylum seekers. And it's the same, the racist, the racist tension is a problem. And it also doesn't boost the economy because they're relying on nearly unpaid labor to run these facilities. Um, so we're looking at who's actually profiting from these uh, detention, from detaining immigrants. GEO Group and CoreCivic are the main ones, and the U.S. government pays them billions of dollars to operate these federal detention centers, um, and uh, CoreCivic was awarded nearly $1 billion in government contracts in 2015. GEO Group was awarded $1.3 billion the same year, um, and both told investors that despite the fact that Customs and Border Protection apprehended fewer people in 2017 uh, due to the administration's proposed immigration policies. Um, they still think it's going to be a good year for business. So they're actually banking on <coughs> the U.S. anti-immigration laws. Um, I think the most shocking part of this is that there is a quota. Um, so it's called Congress's Immigrant Bank Program. So it guarantees that 34,000 detainees per day will be locked up. Because these are for-profit contracts, there is a minimum capacity in the contract. So this is referred to as the Detention Bank Program. They sign a contract with the federal government, and <coughs> they have to have a minimum occupancy rate in order to get the money. That, that they're due. So this crisis at the border, which we already know is a manufactured crisis, much like the, what Reagan's war on drugs was what laid the groundwork for mass incarceration, this crisis at the border is going to continue at least until the contract's up. And then we're going to see what the political wind looks like, if it might end, or if it's going to be renewed with the contracts. So um, this is just to show 2005, <laughs> What, what the cost was, and now to 2013, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. So, um, to finish up, uh, what I try to do in my work is to connect all of these different forms of modern slavery that are happening, because most organizations look at them separately. But what's underlying all of this is extreme inequality, and the inequality caused by white supremacy, patriarchy, um, capitalism, um, all of these different things working together to create masses of wealth for the very few and leaving a lot of people impoverished. So, uh, because I'm an activist, I always leave you with something to do. <laughs> so, um, I want to end back where we started and um, ask you to investigate what institutions you belong to and where did they get their money from. Because if they're investing in private prisons, so are you. And we have to stop making money off the warehousing of humans. That's what that's our responsibility. So you can take some accountability for where where your money goes, where whether it's a university, retirement plan, a healthcare plan. Look and see where they're investing, because it might be investing in ripping children from their families. It might be investing in people dying from lack of healthcare. And be responsible for that. Take some action. And um, these somewhat insurmountable problems can actually be tackled one person at a time. So, thank you.